Since liftoff Sunday, it's been a serious business, but the Apollo 10 team has never allowed it to become a matter of gravity. Bruce Morton reports from the Manned Spacecraft Center in Houston. One little noticed milestone on this flight, David, the return of the sandwich to space. John had a corned beef sandwich, you'll remember, aboard Gemini 3, but the corned beef was a little gamey by the time Young got to it, and the experiment never did exactly work. This time, Young and his colleagues have two spreads, ham salad and chicken salad, in tubes. They can squeeze them onto either party rye or white. Each slice is vacuum sealed, the man in charge of food here said, in its own little spacesuit. The man in charge is a veterinarian, by the way, and takes some kidding about meals even a dog wouldn't eat. But he did let us sample the bread. The vacuum sealing makes it look funny, like a piece of shiny plastic, but it really does taste like bread. The astronauts also have some sea ration type meals they can heat and eat, a great triumph. But everything else is still freeze dried, little grayish blocks of something or other, to which Stafford, Young, and Cernan add water. It doesn't exactly make your mouth water, but I guess it works. For connoisseurs like you, David, of earlier space menus, I should add that everybody still likes the bacon squares and those strawberry cereal cubes still aren't selling. David? They should try eating at the CBS cafeteria to steal from another network. Uh, we're standing by now for television pictures from space within the next few minutes. We should explain that the ground receiving station, Goldstone in Southern California, is not quite in the uh, proper relationship with the spacecraft for the very best quality pictures. They'll be able to use only their smaller antenna, their 85-foot antenna at Goldstone for the first few minutes of this broadcast instead of the huge 210-foot dish. The result of that will be probably uh, snow in the picture, at least in the early stages. CBS News color coverage of the flight of Apollo 10 will continue in a moment. Just a few moments ago, we had a report from Bruce Morton in Houston on the delights of dining at the Shea Apollo 10. But living in the command module is only part of the story. Things get better, if not perhaps just a bit more complicated, when the astronauts open up the lunar module later this evening. It provides room, of course, more space and space. For the rest, here's correspondent Nelson Benton with test engineer Scott McCloud at Grumman Aircraft, where the LEM is made. Well, Dave, David, in some ways, uh, the command module is perhaps a flying hotel, and this one, this limb, is just a bit more austere. For example, uh, you've got to stand up on the flight. There's nowhere to sit down on the limb. And Scott McLeod, why is there no place to sit? Every other spacecraft has seats. Well, basically, we don't require any seats in the lunar module because we are not in the vehicle during launch. And the astronauts, while they're in the LEM, are either experiencing zero G or just one six G. In order to hold us down, rather than using seats, we use something that I can show you from here. It's cabling, like a window washer's outfit, that attaches to the suit at a position like this. There's one from behind you one that comes from in front attaching the same place, and it holds you down toward the floor in space. There is an improvement, though, in the uh, water situation on the limb. What, what is uh, our water situation as compared with the command module? Well, we carry our water with us rather than reconstitute it in the vehicle. Don't have any trouble with hydrogen bubbles, and uh, it actually probably came from uh, Cape Kennedy. But, David, they say there is just a taste of iodine in it. Nelson, while I was uh, uh, listening to you and Scott McCloud talk about living in the LEM uh, on this mission, I was wondering, uh, on future missions, is there much chance to upgrade the livability of something like a lunar module, which is pretty well set in well, its outside diameters? Well, we'll put that to Scott, but I think what we're talking about, Scott, isn't it, is, is a matter of weight, and that situation doesn't change a whole lot. Well, yes. Uh, again, Nelson, we don't require seats, but we can put beds, we string hammocks, in the vehicle if you were required to remain in here for a long stay on the moon. And uh, that stay right now is uh, planned, I think, on Apollo 11, David, for about uh, 20 hours. I might point out that uh, from a res restraining standpoint for the strap hanging trade, we have hand holes all over the cockpit, one up here, one over here, and there's some you can't see over by the circuit breaker panels. I guess uh, I've been around too long. The lunar module is even beginning to look almost pretty to me. Uh, we did some computing uh, just a while ago. Uh, others did, uh, so I can vouch for its accuracy. 
The lunar module now is expected to arrive at the moon 70.15 statute miles from the lunar surface and about 11 minutes. Uh, that's just a bit off course. In fact, it is 1.15 miles off course. The calculation, the percentage of error in this flight, with only one mid-course correction, the percentage of error has been 0.000467%. That is, what, 467 ten thousandths of a percent of error. Nelson, uh, before you and Scott McCloud get away, we did have one other question for you. Uh, I understand that there is an astronaut visitor at uh, Grumman Aircraft today. Uh, that's right. He's not quite, not quite here yet, uh, David. Uh, Alan Shepard, who, who was uh, America's original astronaut, made the first suborbital flight, uh, is on his way to the Grumman plant to do some training. He's been here before. He was here uh, several weeks ago to do some training. and. Uh, about the only thing there is to train up here on is a lunar module and a lunar landscape, so that means something. One thing it means is that that denial from uh, NASA yesterday of the CBS report that uh, that Al Shepard was going to be assigned to Apollo 13, that that uh, denial has to be taken, I would assume, with a grain of salt. They didn't say yes and they, they didn't say no. Yeah, we've got some of that aboard. We're standing by for pictures today from Apollo 10. Uh, TV, we were told when we inquired just a few moments ago, was about a minute away. Uh, earlier today, when we were checking on the TV schedule and uh, when it would go on and when it would go off, we were told that that would depend on the great director in the sky, meaning Tom Stafford. With everything else that they have uh, considered in the space program, it was a surprise to find that uh, they didn't consider the relationship of the receiving station, the television receiving station, to the spacecraft itself today. As we mentioned just a moment ago, the, what we're waiting for is the Earth to come around to have the receiving station in just the proper attitude to the uh, spacecraft. Uh, in the early portions of the broadcast, and we can assume probably those first pictures are coming down now as they try to to improve the quality, they will have to use only the 85-foot antenna. And then uh, later, we hope to be able to tune them in on the 210-foot antenna and get much better quality. We'll listen to this uh, rigmarole as they work it out between Mission Control in Houston and the uh, spacecraft. Apollo 10, 220,000 miles from Earth. You heard Tom Stafford say that he was waiting for Goldstone, which the rest of us are too. Before the Apollo 8 flight, which was the last flight to get out this far, there was some concern that at these deep space distances, the delay in communications would be so great that as a result there would be layover and topping each other and distortion and the like. None of that turned out. They do find that at about this point, there is a, a one and a half second delay in the transmissions. In a verb 82, uh, at these distances, uh, the guidos are uh, not disturbed. They say that's uh, a normal uh, reaction to that uh, integration. Uh, there is a way you can get a better number. If uh, you'd like us to pass it up to you, we'll uh, give it to you. Over. Uh, we we can take uh, T21 to uh, about the middle of the yellow white burn. That ought to us, huh? That's the way we were going to suggest, Dan. Over. Okay. Okay, well, we figured it was strictly due to the conic, but we just wanted to give it a recheck. Roger. The astronauts have been up only a few hours. Uh, hello, Ken. Uh, Houston, uh, we suggest your uh, GET for uh, the uh, P-21, if you're going to run it, is uh, 760014. Over. Roger. 
Thank you. Originally, they were to awaken uh, fairly early today to perform another mid-course correction, but they found that that wasn't necessary, and so they were permitted to sleep until 11 Eastern time this morning. Do we have anything uh, through Madrid at this time that Goldstone isn't locked on? Over. Stafford is asking. In, uh, Houston, uh, we have a, uh, a Madrid acquisition, and they're getting a picture recorded on tape. Uh, a uh, Goldstone uh, lockup is estimated at another 10 minutes. Uh, so uh, dealer's choice on whether to terminate or, or not. 